Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is monotremes, marsupials, and more, mammals of Australia. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Nikki Centinella. Nikki, thank you for being here today and for bringing us with you down to Australia. I look forward to, to uh, hearing all about what a monotreme is. That's a new one for me. Let's go ahead and dive in. <laughs> Thanks, Sunny. Appreciate it. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, so my name's Nikki. I'm going to dive into a whole bunch of mammals. I'm not going to get through all 359 of them, uh, but I am going to pick out some of my favorites and try and break down some of the weird and wacky animals that we have in Australia. Uh, so taking through kind of the three main classifications of mammals that we have. So we have the monotremes, the marsupials, and us, uh, placental mammals. So we'll talk a little bit about each of them, some of my favorites, and some of my experiences with them. And hopefully you'll have a better understanding of what Australian mammal life is like. So this is Marlo having a little bit of a look at a echidna. Um, this is Tamagotchi, who's looking back at her. And we'll revisit these guys in a little bit more detail and we'll, we'll dive into what a monotreme is. Just a little bit about me, first and foremost. Uh, my name's Nikki. I am an expedition leader with Natural Habitat Adventures. I guide in Australia, obviously, and I also guide in Canada, where I am right now. Uh, so I'm excited to head over for the polar bear season coming up in October. It's gonna be good fun. When I'm not guiding, I am a conservation biologist. The photo down below is me uh, just finish, finishing some wetland inventory. I spent about four months around all of the province of Alberta doing some biodiversity monitoring there. But I did start my roots in Australia um, and that's where I call home. We'll go into some of my research projects as well. I'll take you kind of behind the scenes into some of the uh, mammal studies that I've done down there. I'm also, Obviously, a naturalist like a lot of uh, a lot of us are here, and climber, avid reader. I've got books in front of me right now, and Aussie slang. So I'll try and keep my Aussie slang and my Aussie twang to a minimum, but we'll see. <laughs> so we have quite a lot of mammals in Australia. There's quite a few in this picture. We have our classic road signs, uh, including our kangaroo, our koala, our echidna, and then oh, that's a cape barren goose. They are not, so let's just replace that with a wombat. And these are all some of our mammals, including our guides. Uh, this is Lee and Mike in Kangaroo Island, and they are our local guides down there, and they're also mammals. They're our placental mammals. So what makes a mammal, and how do we break them down here in Australia? So in Australia, we have 379 species. Again, I'm not going to touch on all of them. Uh, but we do, majority of them are native. Um, we've been an island on our own for quite a while, um, and that means that we've developed quite a unique assemblage of mammals. And a lot of those are our marsupials. So you can see here we've got 154 species of marsupials. Marsupials we classify as our pouch animals. So marsupial comes from the Latin of meaning has a pouch, um, and they include our kangaroos, our wallabies, our wombats, our koalas, in North America, you have the opossum, and I'll dive into the differences there in a little bit. Um, so marsupials are probably our most iconic known mammals that make up Australia. But we do also have our monotremes. Now our monotremes, monotreme actually means one whole, and it refers to the cloaca that they have. So they don't have multiple holes for their digestive tract at that end, um, but they are really, really special mammals in that they lay eggs. We'll dive into the two that we have. There are five species of monotreme in the world, um, the platypus and four species of echidna. So they're all still echidnas, but there's four different species. And we have both the platypus and the echidna in Australia, which is pretty special. Um, the other group of mammals that we have are the placentals. So the placentals we'll know as ourselves. We have a placenta. So our young come out more developed than our marsupials and our monotremes and they get that nourishment from the placenta. So that includes our humans. It also includes bats, rodents. We have whales and dolphins, as well as our pinnipeds. So they are our seals and sea lions. And we do also have some newer 
placentals that have come to Australia. So we have our dingoes, they were naturalized about 5,000 years ago, and we also have a lot of our uh, newly introduced and sometimes invasive species. So we have foxes and cats now, we do have a few deer running amok, um, and a few other obviously agricultural animals that are brought over. So we do see some other placentals in Australia, but most of our native species, we are looking at mainly small bats, rodents, and then obviously our marsupials. So I'm going to dive into all of these in a little bit more detail um, and hopefully we'll get a bit of an understanding of, of how this breaks down. So I'm going to start with the weirdest because that's the most fun. So I'm going to start with our monotremes. So we can see here this is kind of a breakdown of some rough clades in the evolutionary history of animals. If we come down to the bottom circled in red these are all of our mammals. So mammals coming from mama, which means breast in Latin, and that just means we have mammary glands. We produce milk, and that's how we raise our young. So that's really what classifies mammals. We also classify them through having fur or hair, um, and we also classify them by having three middle ear bones. So we have these three groups, and all of them in Australia, which is pretty exciting, and we're gonna break down each of them. Now what we can see is the monotreme first, we're gonna look at, broke off first. So the marsupials and the placental mammals are more closely related and then the monotremes broke off about 200 million years ago. And this is just one of them. So this is our echidna. I spoke about them a little bit last week uh, but they're an absolutely beautiful creature. I think a lot of people come over and liken them to an anteater or a porcupine and they do eat ants and they do have spines. But different from a porcupine, these spines are embedded in the muscle. And so they have full control over all of their spines. Whereas a porcupine, they act more like a hair. They're kind of just in the skin layer. Um, so they can be shed a lot more easily. Whereas echidnas, it's really, really in there. There's this thin layer of muscle that can, they can control. Uh, they do eat ants. They do prefer ant larvae. You can imagine a nice little fatty parcel instead of a kind of crunchy acidic ant, uh, it's just going to be a little bit more nice uh, to eat, as well as termites, other invertebrates, and they do that by sticking out their tongue, which is up to five inches long, <laughs> and they can do it up to a hundred times a minute. So they're very proficient at lapping up all of those little invertebrates, and they're really important for uh, turning over our soil. So in the same way that you might have chickens in your garden, uh, really aerating that soil and breaking it up, echidnas will turn over up to a ton of dirt a year. So they really are an important part of our ecosystem. They're found all over Australia. And we can see the top photo is of one we saw on an expedition this year of a mainland echidna. So these guys are a bit more adapted to being in the heat, it's quite hot. Um, and a lot of our vegetation can look very kind of grassy, um, that sort of yellow tussock sort of uh, aesthetic. And that's what this echidna at the top is trying to mimic. So by having these long spines, they're able to look more like a grass tussock and they blend in way more. Now on the bottom, we have a Tasmanian echidna. So they are going to be in a lot more kind of bushy, shrubby environments. It's also going to be a lot colder. So they're going to prioritize their hair growth, their fur, instead of those spines. They look a lot fluffier. And then this is just a little one that uh, Matt made out of a little seed pod. <laughs> so the echidnas, they lay eggs. So they are, they come out, I guess, of the young of all of the mammals that we have, they come out the least developed because they're still in an egg. They still need time to grow before they emerge from that egg. Now this isn't like a chicken egg. It isn't like a hard shell and leave it in a nest and walk away. It is a really, really soft, leathery textured egg. And it's kind of like a reptile egg. This egg will be laid. It will be held onto the base of the echidna. And as you can see while they're walking, it's pretty exposed to the ground. So just going to hold on tight to that one. Uh, and when that egg is ready, it will then hatch and the little puggle, so what we call uh, baby monotremes. So for echidna and platypus both, we call it a puggle, which I think is the cutest word. Uh, so they will then latch on to mum 
and they will stay there and they will suckle from mum's uh, milk patch. They don't have nipples, they don't have teats, they have a little milk patch, but they are mammals, they are secreting milk. So this is a little, these are a couple of puggles. They come out, you can see, not fully developed. Uh, they don't have their spines. These guys are uh, a couple months old, so they are starting to get their little hairs and spines coming through. Uh, and they will stay with mum for uh, a few months before they get dropped off in a burrow to then fully develop, where mum will come back every five days or so and feed the puggle before she then moves off into her new territory and leaves the puggle to then go out into the world. So that's a little bit of the, the evolution of, uh, or the development of these little guys. Um, and when they get older, they then become really just looking, turning over that earth. Um, you can see, if you have a look at this one, walking, really nice display. Um, their feet actually face backwards. And because they're digging so much in the dirt, you can imagine you don't want dirt in your face all the time. And so having those feet face backwards, they're able to claw the dirt back and around behind themselves. And that's gonna make it a lot easier to um, spend pretty much all day in the garden, really. Um, and the other type of monitoring that we have is, oh, sorry, I'll introduce you firstly to Peggy. So Peggy is, uh, she has received an Order of Australia. So she's been recognized by the Commonwealth and the Australian government for her contribution to echidnas. Um, if you are fortunate enough to come down on our Southern Australian tour or our Ultimate Australia tour, when we go to Kangaroo Island, we get to meet Peggy. Peggy, I think I've only ever seen her wear this pink shirt, which I absolutely love. Um, but she's been studying echidnas for the last couple of decades. She is the world's foremost expert on echidnas. And she gives us a really good presentation about all of the developmental stages of echidnas, all the behavioral information that we know. And a lot of this she contributed herself. It was through her research or research that she organized with other researchers in Australia that we have the understanding that we have today of echidnas. Uh, we don't unfortunately have a Peggy for our other mon monotreme. And we're still trying to learn a lot more about our other monotreme. So if anyone, I always call this out because one day we'll capture one of you. Um, if anyone really wants to study our other monotreme and start to uncover some of the mysterious steps, we would love to have you to explore our platypus. So this is our platypus. Weirdly enough, this is most closely related to the spiny anteater that we saw before. It is not a duck, it is not a beaver, it is a monotreme as well. We only have the one species of platypus. So compared to the four species of echidna that we have, we just have these guys. They're very elusive, they're very um, secretive in that they are mainly nocturnal feeding and nocturnally active, but we do see them all through the day. It just depends. So earlier in the morning and uh, later in the evening when it's a little bit cool, and if it's cloudy, it's gonna be better chances of seeing a platypus. We still see them all over Australia. And again, these are one of our egg laying mammals. So these guys will also similarly dig a burrow and they will lay little eggs, these little leathery eggs, these underdeveloped monotremes. And they will come out, they will suckle with mum and they will grow up in that burrow before they then come out into the wild. Um, we don't know as much as we would like and as much as we know about echidnas, we know far less about the platypus. But we do know some cool things about them. So they have this sort of look, the bill just looks like it's tacked on there, like someone's just stuck it on with super glue or something like that. But the bill, unlike a, a bird bill, it's, it's not hard, it's quite soft and leathery. And it's because it's filled with all of these electroreceptors. So similar to the echidna eating little invertebrates, these guys are looking for little invertebrates at the bottom of riverbanks. And they use this bill, this leathery soft bill, to shovel through the substrate at the bottom and sense any signals coming off the small prey that are coming through. And they're able to locate this prey and eat them up. And they do this all while their eyes are closed. So this is their main form of sense and their main form of hunting. So they're just absolutely 
bizarre creatures and I absolutely adore them. If you ever see them, it's something that you'll always remember because it's just such a special moment for a thing that really spends a lot of its time trying to be secretive on the banks in its burrows or underwater to be able to see them just scooting along the surface of the water is something really, really special. So these are our two monotremes. So egg laying mammal, monotreme, one hole, this is what we see. We try and spot our platypus. Um, we spend a lot of time down by the rivers, both on our northern and southern itinerary to try and catch a glimpse of these guys. We do also spend some time out on the water uh, and that's always the best way to get a glimpse. So this is me with Bev going for a little bit of paddle down uh, the Derwent River in Tasmania Luchuita. And we were able to see, I I think on this trip, I'm going to get my trips mixed up, but I believe on this trip we saw six sightings. Um, and just seeing them form this little wake is absolutely beautiful. But again, we want to know more about them. So if anyone wants to come down study, I'll, I'll hook you up. <laughs> so we're going to dive into our other category. So we have quite a few mammals to go through. These are our marsupials. These are probably the iconic species of Australian mammals that we think of. These are the kangaroos, these are the koalas, these are the Tasmanian devils. So here is a beautiful male koala. You can see a scent gland on the front. That's characteristic of a male. It's not characteristic of a pouch. Um, it's, way, it's quite high up. Um, and I will jump into what a pouch is. So marsupials means pouch. Um, and all of ours, rather from an underdeveloped egg, we're now going to an underdeveloped young that is now going to stay and develop in the pouch before they then become weaned, become an adult and kind of move into the world. Whereas placental mammals, we're going to develop a lot more and then we come out and we're more or less ready to crawl around, walk around, uh, run if we need. So I'm going to introduce you to some marsupials that you may be familiar with. Uh, the only marsupial that we have in North America that is endemic there is the opossum. Now I say opossum, I know they're often referred to as possums, uh, but they are a completely different genus of possum. They are still marsupials, but they are not related to our possums. So in the top, uh, we have the Virginia opossum, which you guys may be familiar with. So they are your pouch, uh, pouch marsupials. And then we have some of our possums from Australia. So in the centre we have our brush tail possum and then we also have two pygmy possums which I put in because they're absolutely adorable. So I'm a little bit biased but I think our possums are a little bit cuter than the American possums but yeah that's my bias. Uh, we have quite a few species of pygmy possum which I think are absolutely adorable. And we also have the common brush tail possum and the common ring tail possum, which we often see uh, quite a lot through a lot of our expeditions. They will be similar to your possums in North America. They'll be in your backyard, pilfering fruit from your fruit, fruit trees, uh, running along your fence lines, that sort of thing. But we also have some really specially adapted possums. So one of them is believe it or not, going to be found up in the alpine regions of New South Wales. So this is a photo I took up on Kosciuszko uh, National Park on the tallest mountain in Australia. You can see our mountains are a little bit different. Um, really good for backcountry skiing, but I wouldn't expect those double black diamond runs here. <laughs> um, and so in this alpine environment, we have the beautiful mountain pygmy possum. The mountain pygmy possum only weighs about 45 grams when it's fully, like a, a full size adult. Um, and they don't live for that long. But in order to be able to survive in this really, really cold climate, in these big granite boulder fields, they do need to make sure that they're conserving energy when the food supply is low. So these guys will often eat moths. There's a bogon moth, which is really high in fat content. Um, as well as any other little insects and invertebrates that they can find around here. And then during those winter months, they actually go and put themselves into a state of hibernation or torpor. So our little mountain pygmy possum, only, only about 45 grams, you can kind of cup in your hand, uh, will then go to sleep for a period of about eight months. 
The younger ones who need to feed a little bit more are probably going into torpor for about five months, um, but an adult with enough fat reserves will be out for most of the winter. These are our only alpine dwelling marsupials and possum, and they are critically endangered because of the effects of climate change as well as habitat loss. It is such a small area of Australia that we have this alpine ecosystem. And so it's something that we're very much targeting to maintain their habitat, conserve that area. So if you ever get the chance to go up to Kosciuszko uh, National Park, uh, just know that there's a host of species there that are really um, well adapted to this environment. And I think that's really special. Um, oh, I love them so much. <laughs> So we have our marsupials all the way from our alpine and we have them all the way down to our desert ecosystems as well. The big group of marsupials that we're used to is our macropods. So macro, big, pod, feet. They have big feet. I mean, I'm not trying to make them feel bad about it, but they have really big feet. <laughs> so our macropods include our kangaroos and our wallabies. So there's a few in this picture. I'm not sure how many you can find. And here are just some of the names of some of our uh, macropods. Now, I didn't make any of these up. We definitely do have wallabies and wallaroos and paddy melons and quokkas. Um, it does take a little while to get used to all of our names, but they're all our macropods. So they all have big feet and they're characterized by that hopping motion. The uh, one that I want to introduce you to first is our bridled nail tail wallaby. Now this is a small wallaby, they get to about nine kilos. And this is a wallaby that I was fortunate enough to do some conservation work with in Queensland, in our northern state in Australia. And they've called the bridled nail tail wallaby because they have this beautiful bridle that you can see coming down the shoulder, this white pattern. And then right on the tip of the tail, this photo is not very good for it, but they actually have an exposed end on their tail that is like a little, almost like a barb, um, where there's no fur and you can see just the tip of the, the tail skin and bone. Um, we don't know why. <laughs> These guys are also critically endangered. They have quite small numbers due to habitat loss as well as invasive species predating upon them. But we've since established three reintroduction populations and they're doing pretty well. So we're starting to see this population come back, which is really exciting. Now I show you these guys because uh, you might be able to see in this photo at the front, there seems to be a few too many legs. We've got our big macropod hind feet, we've got our front feet, and then we've got some little, we've got a, a long foot and a little tail sticking out. And so this is a mum with a a pretty, pretty big youngin in her pouch who will probably be asked to move out sooner rather than later. You can see those feet really dangling out. But when they first born, they start off a lot smaller. So it was here in this field work that I was able to go into a pouch for my first time. And if you've never really seen or try to imagine what a pouch is, this is us sort of gently opening the inside of a pouch of a bright bridled nail tail wallaby. And we can see this one actually had a young in there, which was really, really special. So it's kind of, it's like a pocket. It's not like an open pocket. It's kind of like trying to go inside your belly button a little bit. Um, it is a little bit moist in there and that's where the teats are held. So that's where the young will be born and they'll, well, they won't be born there. They'll be born and then they'll crawl up kind of like your snail trail into the pouch and they'll follow that using scent markers. Often mum will lick a little trail up and that'll help the young who are so underdeveloped, most marsupial young can't see at this stage. So they kind of feel their way, smell their way, instinctually find their way into this little pouch. And this is where they'll suckle and continue to develop until they're ready to be spilling out of the pouch uh, like this young one here. And a lot of our macropods have this amazing ability to be able to reproduce when times are going really well and to hold on to it when times are tough. So in Australia, um, I know I was asked this last time, we were told like what season is a good time to come to see our marsupials. There isn't necessarily a season. It's not like 
everything's out in spring in the same way that it is in the northern hemisphere um a lot of things are dependent on a longer cycle that can be of years so we have what we call a boom and a bust system and we have a boom when we have a lot of rains coming through and that's when there's a lot of vegetation growth and that supports a lot of um, marsupial growth as well and then our bust is our drought season and so our kangaroos our wallabies our wallaroos will all be quite dependent on this seasonal like larger seasonal change and the kangaroos have this amazing ability to have a lot of young on the go so when conditions are good we're feeling good we're going to try and pass on our genes as much as we can so a kangaroo can actually hold on to an embryo that has been um uh, I was going to what am I trying to say has been fertilized and will hold on to that for up to seven years so for seven years if we happen to be in a trout if the food availability is not good and I don't want to bring my young into that environment they can hold on to that young for seven years and then as soon as those rains come through that food availability comes back there is that safety net they can develop that embryo further and that is I just think absolutely incredible. So these adaptions have really, really focused in on our really dry desert landscapes that sometimes we're known, not known for in the outback. Uh, and so while this one is developing, they could then find another male, they could reproduce again. And then when that uh, embryo is developed and has moved into the pouch, then they can start to develop another young. And then when that pouch young has now moved out and is just living nearby, we call that a young at put, then they can start another one. So they could have three generations of Joey going at the same time. They could have an embryo on pause, one in their pouch and one at foot at the same time. So all of our marsupials are really well adapted for um, this boom bust cycle and making sure that when those conditions are good, they're good to go too. And I think that's really special. And we'll see that in a couple of the other marsupials. These, mar these kangaroos here are having a little bit of a nap. Uh, they're one of the uh, smart ones that don't walk around in the middle of the day like us humans. I think sometimes when we go out and it's 100 degrees outside and you just see all the kangaroos laying in the shade, we know it's time for a siesta. <laughs> So this is a paddy melon. This is also a macropod. It also has a pouch. Um, these guys are found down in Tasmania. They are a lot more round. They're very small. And I usually say paddy melon, like a melon, is an easy way to uh, distinguish that one. And just a few other marsupials I'll show you before we move on to our placentals. This is our tree kangaroo. We find them up north in our rainforest systems. And rather than being good hoppers on land, these guys are a little bit dopey, uh, a little clumsy looking, I think, when you see them on the ground. But when you see them in trees, it's absolutely incredible. So that big foot, that hind foot, is actually going to launch them up and down the trees rather than across the ground. These are our tree kangaroos. We also have our wombats. These are also marsupials. Their pouches faces backwards. Uh, so that we don't get dirt in our pouch when we're digging a burrow. And I talked about these a little bit last week, so I won't go into them too much, but they do have nice square poop, which is always fun to pick up and show you guys. Uh, <laughs> so this is so that they can show their territory without it rolling away. We also have some carnivorous marsupials. So we have our Tasmanian devil, and we have our eastern quolls, as well as our spotted tail quolls, and quite a large assemblage of different marsupials. They all have this pouch and they all have this capacity to breed a little bit more when the conditions are good. This is what makes our marsupial so well adapted to Australia and just shows you a little bit of the diversity that we have here. So we're going to dive into our placentals. We've got two placentals here. We've got some humans and we have some Australian sea lions. And this is down on a beach in Kangaroo Island. Now, a lot of our placental mammals, we don't have a lot of, um, I guess, the larger ungulates that we see in other continents. Um, we don't have our hooved animals. We don't have any native ungulates at all. So there's no native deer. There's no, like, antelope. There's no, like, cattle and horses were only introduced. Instead, we actually look to the ocean for a lot of our placental mammals. 
Um, and this is where, in this place, this is Admiral's Arch. This is a natural archway um, where we can find our long-nosed fur seal. We have 54 species of marine mammal and they're all placental. And I won't go into all of them, but there is quite a lot of opportunity to see them all along our coastline around Australia. So we see our sea lions, our uh, fur seals, we have a large assemblage of whales, um, as well as the bottlenose dolphin, which often like to come surfing with us. It's a pretty special moment. The other large group of placental mammals we have are big, uh, bats. Uh, including our fruit bats or our flying foxes. This photo was taken by Greg Borum, who came on a trip with us uh, in, in April, March, March, and took this beautiful shot in the centre of Adelaide, uh, which is the capital of South Australia, of this large colony of fruit bats. Now, the fruit bats here, you can see my friend Claire is holding one in Sydney. Um, they are very big. So our fruit bats, we have quite a lot of species of bats. They go right from our tiny micro bats that you'll see all across the world up to our really large fruit bats as well. So another group that is really, really diverse. You see these beautiful uh, wings here by Greg um, that show this membrane. And when the sun sets pretty much every night in a spring Sydney, we can watch hundreds of fruit bats kind of fly over the canopy above us and it's it's surreal. Uh, I'd often be walking home from work or from studies and, and watching this flock of fruit bats come over us. Now, I wanna take us, we went to the alpine environments. I know I'm jumping around a lot. There's a lot of mammals here. <laughs> I wanna take us from the alpine environment of our little tiny mountain pygmy possum to the really kind of often seen as desolate outback of Australia. The, de the diversity out in the desert is actually incredible. I've been fortunate enough to spend some of my time out in the desert and doing some biodiversity studies out here. So this was taken with my field partner, Matt, um, and we went out and had a look at the different assemblages of mammals in these desert environments. Here, food, is really, really important. Water is really, really scarce. And so there's quite a few adaptions that we need to hold on to in order to be able to um, make sure that we make it through these hotter months. So this little one, this is actually a marsupial. This is not a placental mammal, but I'll throw it in because I said I'd talk about them. These guys are called a Mulgara. So that's M-U-L-G-A-R-A. -A. Um, and they are only really found around the Strasleki and Sturt deserts. And we have a few introduction programs going on for these guys as well, because we are feeling some impacts from our cats and our foxes. Um, but the other guys that we see, the large group of placental mammals is our rodents. We only have native rodents, uh, only in the, the mouse family. Uh, we don't have any of the other, like we don't have beavers or any of the larger kind of rodent families like prairie dogs and um, squirrels. We don't have any native squirrels. We do have quite a few mice. And our mice, again, I'm incredibly biased. I think are, are very cute. They're also adapted to this extreme environment. This is a dusky hopping mouse. If we have a look here, you can see one just in the background a little bit out of focus is hopping away and they do have this sort of macropod kangaroo look to them. So these guys will be found out um, right in the center of Australia and they're a really important indicator species for the health of our deserts. Uh, and they let us know um, kind of a little bit of an indicator of the health around the desert ecosystem. And they're really important for distributing seeds as well. So these guys are mainly eating our seeds and they're gonna use that to distribute uh, seeds throughout the ecosystem, as well as reduce some of the shrub cover as well. The dusky hobby mouse doesn't need to drink water, which is a good adaption because they often can't find readily available water, um, but they do get enough of their water content through the seeds and the grass roots that they eat. So really, really special. Another species that will wait for rain to boom so they live about 13 months, um, but when the weather's good, they can have several litters. It's not determinate by season. It's really about rainfall. 
So they'll have a really small refuge population. They'll be able to sustain low numbers. And then as soon as that, ra that rain comes, they'll disperse and breed quite readily and be able to spread to new areas. Um, so I got to work with these guys when I was down at the dingo fence. Now, the dingo fence sounds well, like, I don't know. I don't know what people think of it as the dingo fence. It's actually the longest fence in the world. And the effects of the dingo fence are visible from space. So the dingo fence uh, separates sheep country from cattle country, and it shows us where those dingoes, um, how much impact they have. So dingoes are one of our introduced placental mammals, and they were introduced about 5,000 years ago at our best estimate. Um, and they've become a naturalized apex predator. So they're a really important part of our natural ecosystem now. Um, because they've been here for so long, they've really fulfilled that uh, role as an apex predator. And I'm going to show you a short little video, it just goes for two minutes. And this is with uh, my professor, Mike Letnick. So I studied my thesis with him, as well as doing a bunch of different fieldwork projects around Australia with him after I graduated. Um, and he's just going to summarise some of the impacts that we can see from the dingo fence. And I think it's a pretty, pretty special moment. The link is also in the chat, so if this video doesn't play very well for you, feel free to watch it after the seminar. Um, but we did test it before, so it should be good. <laughs> this is the dingo fence. It's a uh, 5,000 kilometre long fence. It's the, the longest fence in the world. Um, it's, it's, it's longer than the Great Wall of China, but maybe not as well built. And uh, it, its purpose is to keep dingoes out of New South Wales or out of sheep grazing lands. And um, it's very effective. It, it, on this side of the fence, um, we're able to grow sheep because there's no dingoes to kill the sheep. But on this side of the fence, they mainly grow cattle because cattle can cope with dingoes. Mike has been monitoring study sites on both sides of the fence for the last 15 years to see how the removal of the apex predator might have affected the ecosystem as a whole. The dingo fence has been a remarkable natural experiment. Um, into understanding the effects that apex predators have on ecosystems. Dingoes have not been present in great numbers in New South Wales for um, at least 80 years. And um, you can see the differences everywhere. There's many, many more kangaroos and foxes and cats on this side of the fence. And, and not very many native small mammals like hopping mice or mulgaras or plains mice. On this side of the fence, where the dingoes are, there's, there's very few kangaroos. Hardly any foxes, very few cats, but there's lots of native small mammals. There may only have been one dingo for every 15 square kilometres, but removing that apex predator has transformed the entire ecosystem. In areas without dingoes, the vegetation has been denuded by kangaroos and woody shrubs are taking over. On the other side of the fence, dingoes have kept kangaroo, cat and fox numbers down giving the native small mammals and vegetation a chance to survive. The change in the ecosystem has been so great, it's visible from space. The areas with dingoes remain greener for longer after rain. They are more productive and have far greater biodiversity. Here in South Australia, where there's lots of dingoes, um, the sand dunes are actually a different shape to what the sand dunes are just over the border in New South Wales. And the reason for that is that dingoes, by suppressing numbers of foxes and cats, make the environment better for small mammals like hopping mice and mulgaras. So the hopping mice prey upon the, the, the seeds and the seedlings of the shrubs, and so they keep shrub numbers down. And in an environment without the shrubs, there's more movement of sand, and um, we get these much more open environments. The main thing is that predators have these far-reaching effects that extend um, way beyond the species that they consume. So that's just a little summary of uh, the effects of the dingo fence and not having apex predators in this kind of dynamic environment. I likened it to the Yellowstone wolves, where we've seen the way that the rivers will run, will change. Um, we're seeing the sand dunes change in the same way when we don't have our dingoes. And uh, it's, it's really special when you go out there and understand that in something that looks so barren and so 
harsh to live in, that there is actually a really, really big assemblage of mammals, as well as other like reptiles and a lot of species diversity that's really important for a lot of Australia. So um, having this kind of comparison has shown how important those dingoes, even though they were only brought in 5,000 years ago, how much uh, of a vital role they play as an apex predator so that they can help us protect those smaller animals like our cute little hopping mice and our Mulgara as well. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a snapshot at some of the mammals of Australia. Again, there's nearly 400 of them. So I have definitely gone through pretty quickly. Um, but I hope that when you come down, you, you can look at them like Marlo's looking at Tamagotchi with a little bit more understanding um, and the differences between our marsupials and our monotremes and our placentals. So that next time you come, you can be a little bit more close and cuddly with them. This is one of our uh, wombats at the Bunurong Wildlife Rescue. So this little wombat does need some cuddles before they're ready to be released. Um, and that we can kind of work together within this ecosystem to make sure that we're all sustaining the huge diversity that we have here in Australia. And I hope you guys come down and, and see what you can see. Thank you. Nikki, thank you so much. Before we start the q and I just want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, but we got lots of questions, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, how many eggs does an echidna lay at once? Now, the echidna only lays one egg at once. So it is actually slow reproductive rate. Um, they just lay one egg at a time. They often lay, they can lay more frequently, but they often only lay once every five years. So it's a really slow process to be raising these echidnas. Um, but the echidnas do live up to 50 years of age. So we are, we've got a longer time to reproduce and they are found all over Australia. There's something really special about the echidna that they're so generalist that we can find them all the way down in Tasmania and all the way up to the Northern Territory. Um, and they're really kind of occupying this whole space. They're just so well adapted as well as our other species. So the, we just have the short big echidna and then we have the long big echidna. I talked about there being five species of monotreme. The other three are found further north in the islands up in New Guinea. Um, but we do have our short big here. Yeah, so it's slow going, but they get there. Um, who, uh, let's see how to phrase this. Does the platypus have any predators? Yes. Um, they are pretty good at being elusive. Um, they will try and, uh, they're quite skittish and they will try and stick to the banks as much as possible. But they do have predators as with most of our smaller um, marsupials and monotremes around Australia. Um, we don't have heaps of information on, on what would readily take them all the time. Um, they can defend themselves if they need to. They do have short claws and the males also do have a ven venom spur um, that they mainly use for male-male competition but they could use to defend but I would imagine some snakes would have a go we have some large um, monitor lizards um, as well as big birds of prey like our wedge-tailed eagle down in Tasmania if anything is available especially when those conditions are a bit poorer in Australia um, I wouldn't be surprised to see any of those having a go. We all are also seeing an introduction of foxes and cats throughout Australia, um, and they will also predate on a lot of our native species, including the platypus. So we do have a lot of introduced predators um, that are um, a bit disruptive to our ecosystem. Hmm. Um, do the people of Australia uh, recognize the importance of protecting monotremes and marsupials? Do they realize how special they are? Yeah, um, as with anything, it's it's quite a big and complicated question. Um, I think monotremes, so our echidnas and platypus are, are very iconic, and I think that iconic nature really lends itself to uh, conservation value. Um, there are a few studies that show what makes a species more likely to be conserved. Often it's the cute and cuddly, but it's also the ones that we're familiar with. And iconic species mean that they're more likely to be conserved. 
Um, I think most Australians really appreciate how different our animals are. And I think we see, I know me as a kid, and now only just living in Canada recently, um, we often see a lot of Northern hemisphere species through the lens of like culture, stories, TV, movies. And so like when I first saw my first skunk, I just thought it looked like the cartoon skunks that I used to see and I thought that was incredible. So I think in Australia, we're pretty used to our animals being so unique from the rest of the world that we, we do take quite a lot of ownership over that and we are quite proud to have them. The kangaroo is like an iconic symbol for Australia. Um, but with such a huge diversity as with anything, there are species that some people don't know about. Um, I would say if I asked a lot of people on the street in the cities what a Mulgara was, I wouldn't get many responses. Um, but they're just another one of those really important marsupials just in small pockets around Australia. So it does depend on where you are and, and who you ask, but we are just trying to always open that conversation. But I think, yeah, a lot of our iconic species um, do get a lot of attention and Australians realize how special we have it. <laughs> Good to hear. Um, are twins ever born to kangaroos or wallabies? Yes, um, it can happen. It's not as common, um, but it certainly can happen in the way that placentals can have twins as well. Um, it's just a bit of a chance if, if two eggs happen to be released, then, then it can happen. Um, we really don't see it that often, however. So I don't know whether or not there is a control with being able to control so much with the embryonic diapause, we are able to hold on to those embryos that maybe having twins might not be energy efficient for you at a certain time. Um, so I don't know the exact stats on that, but I definitely don't see that many twins. It can happen, but it's, it's not common. Hmm. Um, do Tasmanian devils only live in Tasmania or can they be found in Australia or New Zealand as well? They're only found in Tasmania now. They used to be around on the mainland, but they are no longer found there. Um, and that was the same with our Tasmanian tiger as well. So they are very much restricted to Tasmania and that state being an island has served as a really important stronghold for them and other um, species as well, because they don't face the same threats that they may do on the mainland, specifically foxes, um, as well as, cats and other predators and then also habitat loss as well the conservation in Tasmania is the conservation area is a lot larger um, and so it really has become a stronghold on Tasmania but they they have been found on the mainland as far as I'm aware there's no talks of reintroducing Tasmanian devils the focus is on quolls um, which are another small carnivorous marsupial to release back into the mainland because they were most recently there Interesting. Um, are flying foxes the largest species of bat? The flying fox is actually a, a genus, might be a higher clade than that, of bats. I think there's about 70 species of flying fox and they're found not just in Australia as well, they're found in other parts of the world, um, but they are part of a group called the mega bats. Um, so they are our biggest type of bat in Australia. There are a few different species. But yeah, notably very large and very, oh gosh, they're just so picturesque to watch over the, the setting sun. <laughs> um, do you know how it, dingoes were introduced 5,000 years ago? Where did uh, they come from? Yeah, there's a few different theories about how this happened. The main one that goes around is um, through actual um, human trade with the islands to the north and it was almost likened kind of to a domestic dog but less domesticated um, coming through on trade that was happening with um, the First Nations of Australia as well as Indigenous communities in the islands to the north um, and that they may have come across in one of those trade routes. Uh, there were uh, also studies and discussions on whether there was a land bridge to the north, which there was, but it was a bit further, it was longer ago. Um, so whether there was a land bridge, but the timing doesn't really line up with that. Um, Australia's really been an isolated island for so long and that's why we have so many unique species. Um, 
the dingo is more likely to have come through people. Yeah. Hmm. And is there any um, discussion about removing the fence? Oh gosh, it's uh, yeah, it's a highly contentious issue in that it's been there for decades, and sometimes when things kind of just exist, changing it can be quite difficult. Um, we are very dependent on our sheep export and sheep agriculture in Australia. We have like world renowned merino wool is developed here. Like it's a really big industry. Um, so it's definitely seen as a way to protect sheep livestock from dingoes. And while dingoes do take sheep, we've actually found more in recent studies that they probably don't want to. Um, they, will scavenge a few but their population numbers never sustain like you never get huge packs of dingoes the way that you have social wolves dingoes are more solitary so even if we did release dingoes into new south wales the population would regulate at a certain level and we wouldn't see too many so i think it is possible i think it's going to be tricky with industry and agriculture um public perception depends um, just because it's been there since, yeah, like the 60s. So, um, so much of our landscape has changed. There's so many other things that we need to change. Um, but we are starting to see some reintroductions of dingoes on the inside of the dingo fence in smaller isolated pockets, which is really interesting to see and really amazing because they do kind of keep this natural limit on kangaroos as well as feral animals like foxes and cats. Um, we're starting to see them being reintroduced into national parks, um, especially where they can be kind of separated by either water barriers, fences, or even just um, uh, like development of, of houses and stuff. So you don't have cheap agriculture right next to it, but they're re releasing dingoes into a few national parks to help restore that native ecosystem. So it is happening and the value is being seen more and it's being talked about more. Um, so it's a really interesting conversation that's happening, but there is a lot of nuance to it at the moment. Yeah. Very interesting. What advantage is there in raising young as a marsupial rather than as a placental mammal? So um, I think mobility has a lot to do with it. There's a number of factors. Um, firstly, sometimes things just evolve and it works and you don't change it because it works. Uh, but in Australia, we have this high percentage of uh, marsupials. They would have all radiated from each other. So because Australia has been isolated, that genetic diversity has been able to expand. And we're seeing um, a lot of radiation coming from the same root. So we're not going to develop back in, into placentals because we don't need to. Um, but being able to have an underdeveloped young means that uh, it's a different energy requirement for what you feed internally versus what you produce through milk. Um, so we do see this sometimes in placentals as well. You'll try and have a placental young early and then feed it high fat content milk rather than relying on other like proteins and stuff within the body. So the types of energy available can determine whether or not it's better to pop out early, so to speak. Um, and the other thing is that they're mobile. So you're able to kind of have uh, young, really underdeveloped, but then external suckling at your own rate. You can move around quite freely. Um, it's a different take on your, like an, a calorie, caloric take on your body. Um, and then also being able to move them out as much as possible. So we do see some that will use burrows um and try and leave them there develop and come back and that sort of thing so it's uh yeah just an, another way of doing things and it seems to work <laughs> well that's the last question we have time for today so i will hand it back to you for closing comments all right thank you sunny um yeah thanks guys i i hope you had a good exploration of all the different types of monotremes marsupials and placentals that we have in australia there's a lot there. I know it's a lot to unpack. Um, if, yeah, if you want to find out more, we'd love to see you down under. Um, and there's quite a few different uh, resources as well. And if that video, you want to see anything more about that, you're welcome to reach out to um, in the comment section and the questions. I can read through them. 
um, and just let us know. But I'd be excited to see you guys down there. <laughs> Nikki, thank you again for taking the time to present for us today. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.